Hello, viewers. Um, I hope you um, enjoyed the last episode in this new format. So what I'm going to be focused on today is the second uh, Marine Division on Guadalcanal, which many uh, not, don't even realize that the second Marine Division was actually on Guadalcanal. It was only the first Marine Division. Well, you'll find out in today's um, uh, episode that uh, the second Marine Division played a major part in the Guadalcanal campaign. You'll note, too, also, I'm wearing my lucky USMC hat that you've probably seen in some of my videos um, on walking the battlefield. It went everywhere with me on the Guadalcanal battlefield. You know, it's basically, a, I guess, literally seen the war, so to speak, and it's a, a veteran of Guadalcanal itself. You know, it's sweat-stained and, and frayed in the edges, but it's my lucky cap, so I hope you don't mind. So I'm just going to drop off now, and we'll get started with this uh, slides, okay? So what you'll see here, the second Marine division on the left-hand side is the uh, symbol for the second Marine division. This is the, I think the later symbol they picked up in 43 or 44. Um, at the end of the uh, episode, you'll see the, the original um, shoulder patch that they patterned after the first Marine division shoulder patch. And I like this little slide here on the, the right-hand side, this photo, so to speak, it's a, um, it was on Samoa. So that was the, different uh, regiments of the second marine division changing over and you also it's a good depiction of uh, the new equipment uh, compared to the old equipment you'll see a few of the guys there smiling at the the uh, one marine in his kelly cap or the world one style cap in his in his um older style uh, uniform field uniform or the the other marines are wearing their quote modern the newest style uh, helmets and uniforms they had at the time so it's a good um depiction and uh, of how the Marines looked before they um, went to Guadalcanal itself. So this was taken from uh, the second Marine division book. It was published shortly after the war uh, for the veterans. It's a good book. Um, they're fairly rare and they're expensive. If you ever get your hands on them, it's a great book. It had some great illustrations in it. So this is one of the illustrations here and it shows the, the division there and it was, um, formed in uh, January 1941, along with the 1st Marine Division. So the reason they were brigades, the 1st and 2nd uh, Marine Brigades, and they were formed from the divisions. So nowadays, the 1st Marine Division is on the West Coast, and the 2nd Marine Division is on the East Coast. But in 1941, it was vice versa. So you can see the 2nd Marine Division there was uh, based around San Diego, Camp Elliott. Um, you also notice a little side note here. It says Iceland in the far top right with a polar bear. So the um, 6th Marine Regiment was sent there in 1941 to garrison Iceland. Uh, it was pre-war, but the U.S. had a deal with the, the, uh, the British government to form um, garrison troops to um, protect Iceland at the time. So the, um, the Marines adopted the polar bear patch, and it was copied from the British units that was actually stationed there. And then you'll see the line shooting out from the, the west coast there going into the Pacific. So it's the 2nd Marines, 8th Marines, and the 6th six Marines. You really can't see it that well. But there were the three rifle regiments of the 2nd uh, Marine Division, and the artillery regiment was the 10th Marines. So the 8th uh, Marines was sent out to garrison Samoa along with the 7th Marine uh, Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. This here is a, um, a brass depiction. Um, it's a plaque, a giant plate, actually. If you look at my video, um, I think it's called American Memorial um, Naval Battles, you'll see this there, and I, I go into great detail explaining the actual panel. But it's a great um, depiction of the Guadalcanal campaign, and, and when you're actually up on the memorial, if you ever get the chance to visit Guadalcanal, you're on the American Memorial and overlooks Iron Bottom Sound, and you know, you're looking at this plate, it points, you can just point to all the, the areas this plate actually uh, depicts. Uh, the reason I put it here, one, it's a, it's a great uh, photo and it's a great depiction. It's a great plate, but it's also it was designed by a member of the 2nd Marine Division. And you won't be able to see it unless you have some great eyes, but it's in the bottom right. Um, it was uh, commissioned for the 50th anniversary, so, so 1992. And there you'll see it's got the, the different naval battles on it and it's got the unit patches and it's got the different places and it says you are here so that's where the memorial is so yeah paul's and had a 
good look at this. And then you see in the top uh, part there, that's Florida Island. So I'll leave it here if you can have a, a quick look. And I'll talk about the 2nd Marine Division uh, real quickly before we get into the their actual roles on Guadalcanal. So the 2nd Marine Division, even though they were second in name, they weren't uh, second in nature and some of the things they did. You know, the 2nd Marine Division, uh, more specifically 2nd Marine Regiment, uh, they were the first U.S. Uh, land unit to commence offensive operations in World War II. Um, the second Marines had the first um, Marine artillery and tank units to engage in offensive operations or actually to fire in World War II. Um, and the second Marine Division had the first troops to actually land on foreign soil in World War II offensively. So, yeah, they were they were the first in a lot of things, even though they, uh, many think the first Marine uh, Division was, was the first. All right, so that takes us up to um, the Guadalcanal campaign. So in July 1942, I think I mentioned earlier, and I mentioned in my other videos too, that the 7th Marine Regiment was a, one of the um, infantry regiments of the 1st Marine Division. So they were garrisoned Samoa at the time. So Vandegrift, who was the major general commanding the 1st Marine Division, needed a, another regiment. So the 2nd Marine Division uh, loaned one of their regiments, that being the 2nd Marine Regiment, um, to the 1st Marine Division. There's a lot of ones and twos in here, and he, he gets tongue-tied sometimes. It gets a good bit confusing, so it takes a, many years of studying this so I can get it right. <laughs> um, so they performed a, they were the 3rd uh, Rifle Regiment of the 1st Marine Division. So they were going to be, for the invasion, their role was going to be a reservist role, and they were later going to be used, after the reserve role, they were going to be pulled out and sent to the Santa Cruz Island. You know, they were the plan to invade there, but that never come to fruition because you'll see that they needed the 2nd Marines or they needed every Marine they could get in this campaign. So the objective of the first, uh, the 2nd Marines was active reserve, and also they are going to cover these points on the initial invasion of Tulagi and, and Tanambogo. So they were going to protect the flanks, and that was why, the second Marines were the first guys to land um, during the Guadalcanal campaign. So that was, if you look to the left-hand side, he's got the first battalion, the seven, second Marines under Lieutenant Colonel Hill. So it was 0740 on the 7th of August, uh, B Company of the first battalion, the second Marines, or Bravo one or B, B12, landed at the village of Haleta. So the there was some information saying the Japanese had a small garrison there at Haleta, and the if those Japanese was there, they pr could provide, um, uh, I guess, inflating fire to the 1st Marine Raider Battalion and 2nd Marines, 2nd Battalion, the 5th Marines, who were landed on Tulagi, you know, about 20 minutes later. And also, if you look to the far right, um, the rest of the 1st Battalion, the 2nd Marines landed at Halebo uh, Peninsula to provide that same uh, flanking protection for um, Lieutenant Colonel Williams and his 1st Parachute Battalion. It was landed at Kavutu. Tanimbogo too, at, um, later in the day. So at 0740, uh, they landed. They fired the first shots from a Lewis gun on the bow against the village, but when they landed, they found the village unoccupied. The Japanese had left uh, very quickly, and the Marines reboarded the boats and went back into reserve. Same with the first rest of the battalion at Atlanta Halevo Point. They didn't see any Japanese. But the 1st Raider Battalion and the 2nd Battalion of the 5th Marines, and especially the 1st Par Parachute Battalion, met hard resistance in Gavutu and Tulagi. Um, they met so hard resistance that the uh, Brigadier General uh, Rupertus, who was the overall commander at uh, the, the Northern Operation here, uh, called for the 2nd Marines um, to provide um, some reinforcements and to, to assist. So B Company, 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, were given the task on the the end of the uh, 7th of August toward the end of the day to do amphibious assault against Tanimbogo. So this next slide I'll show you here. This is looking at Gavutu from Tanimbogo, and you look on the left-hand side, that's the causeway. The causeway was a concrete man-made, um, um, I guess, track that linked both of these small islands together. And I've got a better picture here. So that's the causeway. So a B-12 landed against Tanim, or, um, Tanimbogo, and they were quickly um, pinned down and beaten back toward the end of the day. So their amphibious assault 
um, was a failure and they managed to get back into the boats. So the next day they committed the third battalion, the whole battalion, the third battalion, the second Marines to take Tanimbogo. So the plan was I company and L company and along with two tanks from the second uh, Marine tank battalion uh, was going to hit Tanimbogo. So the, the first parachute battalion and the weapons company of the third battalion of second Marines were going to provide covering fire. So on the morning of the 8th, uh, the attack commenced. So L Company was going to do a bayonet charge straight down this causeway you're looking at here. And I Company, along with the two tanks, were going to do amphibious assault. So I Company, the two tanks landed. Um, they managed to get ashore. And L Company charged down this causeway um, under fire. So they uh, they were pinned down, but they all they managed to make it to the island. Um, L Company. Uh, L Company made it to the island. I Company made it to the island, and the two tanks did too. But the two tanks got in ahead of the infantry on support, and they were quickly overwhelmed by the Japanese. There were some like 20 to 30 Japanese just come streaming out, you know, with crowbars and Molotov cocktails. And then, you know, I think the lieutenant leading one of the tanks was shot in the turret and killed. And they overran in the two tanks and, and they destroyed them. But they, um, the Marines managed to um, eliminate by the end of the day all the the Japanese on that island. So they ended the resistance at Tanimbogo and Gabutu and uh, Tulagi. So we'll go back. So the second Marine division, instead of um, sailing away and going to Point Cruz or sorry, Santa Cruz Island, they were left to garrison Tulagi, Tanimbogo and Gabutu. So I'll go back here to this slide. So yep, Gabutu, Tanimbogo, and Tulagi there, they were to garrison it. Uh, the, the Raiders and the Segment and the 5th Marines left a short time later to go um, to assist at Guadalcanal with the, the first, rest of the 1st Marine Divisions fighting there. So why did they leave a whole regiment garrison these three islands? Well, the main reason was the, the Marines thought the Japanese was going to do a major counterattack, and the first place they thought were, they were going to hit was Tulagi uh, due to its... Um, facilities there especially it's its port and then once they took Tulagi um, they could use it as a springboard to counterattack on Guadalcanal so they garrisoned that you know throughout the whole campaign actually over six months then Tulagi later became a, a major naval base especially with the PT boats but I've got a good video on Tulagi and Genevu uh, uh, Tanibogo and Gavutu and um, I'll show what it looks like then and now yeah, you can't pronounce these uh, islands too quick. You'll screw them up just like I did then. All right. So these next photos here, there's three new three photos, and they actually depict the Second Marine Regiment um, when they were garrisoned um, um, Gavutu and Tanimbogo, mainly Tulagi though. And I think these three photos are actually on on Tulagi, but these are definitely a Second Marine Regiment, and during their time they were a garrison in it. So this is part of the uh, 10th Marine. Regiment is one of the battalions with the 75 millimeter pack howitzers there, and you'll see it there actually on Tulagi uh, going through some drills or posing for the photographer. This is a, a Catholic mass there on Tulagi um, performed for the 2nd Marine Regiment. It's Chapel of Our Lady of Victory, I think. Yeah, Our Lady of Victory Chapel. So I don't even know if it's Catholic Chapel, but it's our Lady of Victory. It's a pretty cool name. And this is some of the officers from um, one of the battalions of the 2nd Marine Regiment. You can tell they'd been in Tulagi for a bit because they're growing out their beards. Um, some have beards. Probably they're trying to grow their beards. They're probably like when I was 18 or 19 or 20 as a young Marine, I tried, but I grow a mustache once and it didn't come to fruition. So it was more embarrassing with a peach fuzz. So I shaved it off. So this is a pretty good photo. It's, very um very detailed. So yeah, they were garrison uh, to Lagi. So on the fifteenth of September, uh, nineteen forty-two, right after the Battle of Bloody Ridge, um, Vandegrift called for some additional reinforcements. So the additional only re additional reinforcements he could call from was from Tulagi and the Second Marine Regiment. See, the Third Battalion, and the Second Marines uh, went from Tulagi. They landed at Guadalcanal as the division reserve. So they'll put in division reserve. And um, they're actually what limited uh, mobile um, 
assets the division had. They had them in some trucks, especially some captured Japanese trucks. They had some um, half tracks with 75 millimeters. They put some of these companies in these trucks to act as a mobile reserve because the Marines had a um, interior lines and they had the coastal track. They could move them back and forth. So 3-2 became kind of like a mobile unit and they could move very quickly if they needed to. So here's some of the 3rd Battalion the 2nd Marines landed on Guadalcanal. So once again, they got a canal. They, um, most of their camps are in the old coconut plantations groves, which provided great cover, especially for overhead protection. And they were very um, clear, especially from the jungle. So don't have to worry about that. So there they are landing on Guadalcanal and forming their camps. Here's one of the veterans. Uh, I don't know what battalion uh, Barney, Sergeant Barney Walter was in, but he's definitely in the 2nd Marines uh, Regiment. And it's, Good depiction of one of their camps with the, the rows of the coconut trees. So 3-2. They needed to use them as a maneuver element because they're fairly fresh. So on the third battle of Matanical, fought between the 7th and 9th of October, 1942, 3-2 um, was thrown into the uh, the fray is one of the main assault battalions. Now, <clears throat> I've got a, a video on the, this Matanical offensive in particular, and my Facebook site, Guadalcanal Walk in the Battlefield, I have a, a number of posts on this uh, particular battle, a lot of then and now photos. You go there and have a good look. Uh, I don't get to uh, pin down into this battle. I'll just talk about what the uh, Second Marine Regiment, or sorry, the Second Marines, um, the Third Battalion, uh, did in this one. So you'll see the red arrow there. So the, the, basically the plan was the, the 5th Marines were going to move through and, and pin the Japanese at the mouth of Matanikau. And then uh, three maneuver battalions were going to cross single, um, one at a time across the one log bridge, the Japanese Nippon Bridge, they caught it, roughly where that uh, arrow is. And then they were going to, one battalion each was going to swing down a series of ridges. So you got the whaling group, 2-7, which is 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, and 1-7 was going to um, go down those. And then that, by doing that, they would um, trap the Japanese at the mouth of Matanikau, which was one of the battalions of the 4th Japanese Regiment, 2nd Japanese Division. So the 5th Marines um, ran into some of the Japanese. It actually pushed themselves across. And then you'll see the little depiction of a, a Japanese beachhead there, a riverhead, you could call it. So they had to eliminate a pocket of those guys. Once they eliminated that pocket, um, three, two, um, and the rest of the seventh Marines moved out. Now this is a good time to, you'll see the whaling group. Now three, two was part of the whaling group. And I mentioned, I think in my previous episode about, uh, the Getty patrol about Bill whaling. Now Bill whaling was a, a Marine Colonel who was the executive officer of the, the fifth Marine regiment. He was a, um, pretty famous pre war old, old Corps Marine or old Marine Marine. He was enlisted. Uh, Marine, I think, uh, I think he was enlisted. He was definitely in, in the Great War, and he fought in a series of battles with the Marine Brigade there. Um, fought through the Banana Wars. He was Olympic uh, shooter, and one fame is that uh, he was a great shot. He was very well known for his patrolling skills and his bushman and hunting skills. So he went to Vandegrift, the division commander, and said, "Look, you know, we're we're lacking in patrolling skills because at that time the 1st Marine Division or any of the Marine Divisions didn't have dedicated reconnaissance units or scout sniper units to, to provide that the eyes and ears for the division commander, so to speak. So he came up with a plan. He says, look, can I go and go through the units and, and, and pick out uh, Marines with backgrounds in hunting and bush skills and shooting and then form them in a small unit, uh, do some additional training with them and then take them out uh, behind the lines and do a lot of reconnaissance with them. And then once I gain a bit of experience, then we can send them back um, and rotate them through uh, the units to, to share that knowledge. So the division commander thought that was a great idea. And he, um, um, he had Whaling form this group. So they, they performed a lot of reconnaissance throughout the whole campaign um, for the, um, they were calling the scouts and the snipers um, for the division. Um, I'm still doing a lot of research on these guys. Not much information out there on them. I'm just trying to find the exact size. And no, I can't find that information out or even the guys that was in the unit. Um, hopefully I'll do find that out one day. I mean, there was one guy, they called him nicknamed Daniel Boone. He had a big, long red beard and he was like 
this sergeant, he's supposed to be the best scout they had, you know, a couple of memoirs uh, discuss um, him. In fact, the Marines used to call this whaling group, uh, whaling and his Daniel Boone men, they call them the Daniel Boone men. So, you know, out of reference to the great outdoorsman, American outdoorsman and explorer. Um, so I think they're only roughly about platoon size, probably 20 to 30 of them. So wasn't that many of them. But anyway, um, they had a whaling group. So there was whaling scouts and snipers attached to 3-2. So on the morning of the 9th, after they cleared that pocket, the 5th Marines wiped that pocket out, they moved, moved uh, across the river. And, um, and they pinned a number of Japanese there at the mouth of Matanikau. In fact, 1-7 um, at the ravine, Chesty Pullers unit, and I discussed it in my previous episodes, and I showed the ravine. Um, they destroyed a Japanese battalion. It was bivouacked in that ravine. Um, but this area, you'll find out later in that in this epi episode that um, there's a lot of fighting in that area, especially by the rest of the 2nd Marine Division and the other Marines um, throughout the campaign. We'll all discuss that a bit later. So 3-2 was used. They wiped the Japanese out, basically, and then they were pulled back. Um, the whole plan was going to go all the way to Kukumbona, which is in form of troll base, and wipe the Japanese out of the Matanikau area, Point Cruz area. But the um, the Marines were receiving reports that the Japanese uh, was was sending reinforcements in to a major assault. So they pulled these Marines back to um, to the perimeter to, to protect the uh, the perimeter and the, the airfield, which is the main main goal. Um, I guess the Marines had their intelligence from them because they'd broken the naval code and some of that information was being leaked to the division. So that was, uh, it was true. The Japanese were forming up for a major assault, which later became the Battle of Henderson Field. So a lot of Japanese effort was coming down the um, toward Guadalcanal at the time. So it was actually a pretty smart move by uh, Vandegrift for pulling these Marines back. So 3-2 moved back to the perimeter. Once again, the form... Um, the division reserve, but the rest of the second Marines were still at garrison to logging. Now that brings us up the push to the Cucumbona between the first and the fourth of November. Um, so basically, what happened on the 9th of October? Um, I'll, I'll backtrack there. Um, the 9th of October. I forgot to mention. 1-2 was garrisoned to Lagi, but they were called upon to do a raid. They did a raid at a place called Ayola. Now, Ayola was on the far um, east side of Guadalcanal, and there's reports there were some Japanese there. So they took these the 1-2 guys, and they formed them up, and they did a raid. Um, the raid went successful. They killed about 30 Japanese, but unfortunately, they lost one of their um, company commanders. The only Marine to die in that actual raid on the ground. He was shot by a sniper. But Earlier in the morning, unfortunately, the Marines suffered a major setback, the 1st Battalion, 2nd Marines, because um, they were being towed over to Aeola by YP boats. So they were in the Higgins boats, you know, the landing crafts, and these YP boats were um, um, towing them over. So basically what happened was, um, I'm going to throw my, my face back on here a bit. Um, so basically what happened was, these YP boats were the Yippie boats, as the Marines call them, but they were, um, I guess, conscripted tuna boats that the U.S. Navy had conscripted or, or pressed into service before the war. They're actually good boats, you know, they're good, like, uh, they were described as tuna boats. So if you ever see a photo of them, they look like tuna tugs or, or fishing boats. But the Raiders used them especially, and they, um, they were used a lot to, to convey transport um, supplies back and forth, especially from Stoggy to the Guadalcanal and back and forth. So these, this tuna boat was uh, towing them, and apparently a wave come over the bow of the uh, Higgins boats because they're flat bottom, I guess, in rough seas. And it capsized. It killed a number of Marines. I think it's 17 or 18 uh, went down, never to be seen again, lost at sea. So that, that was a major setback and um, demoralized the battalion. You know, that was the largest loss it had, you know, uh, up to date in the war. And then it had to do a raid. So, yeah, demoralized them. So um, I had to mention that bit because it was very um, prevalent in the 2nd Marine Regiment at the time. So at the end of October, on October 29th and 30th, the rest of the division, or sorry, the rest of the regiment was brought over from Tulagi. 3-2 um, uh, had left and went to garrison Tulagi, and then they brought the 1st and 2nd Battalion, the 2nd Marines over to once again to be fresh troops and to be used for a new offensive 
uh, by Vandegrift. So they landed on 29th and 30th October, and then they were going to be used in this um, push to the Cucumbona, or the, uh, the first of November offenses, as the Marines called it. So the, at the Battle of Henderson Field, and you'll see a lot of my or our videos on Coffin Corner, especially in the John Bassalone um, and the Mitchell Page episodes that talks about in detail uh, of this Battle of Henderson Field. So it was a major Japanese assault, air, land, and sea, and it was defeated. And the Japanese um, uh, suffered a major, major setback. So Vandergriff wanted to take advantage of this. So the 1st of November, um, he called for another offensive to a Kukumbona. He was going to wipe these Japanese out, out once and for all. So he had seven battalions uh, to do their major assault. So the 5th Marines, 3rd uh, Battalion, the 7th Marines under with Whale, the Whaling Group, and he had the 2nd Marines. Um, so he had two battalions of the 2nd Marines and a battalion of the 164th U.S. Army Unit to form a, a, another regiment. So they were in reserve. So the plan was the 5th Marines were going to push over on the 1st of November to the um, objective line. You'll see the objective line. you got the Matanikau River. Then if you look to the left where the little pocket is, where you got 2, 5, 1, 5, and 3, 5, you'll see a creek. That creek or stream uh, was the objective line. So they were going to push to the objective line, and then the 2nd Marines are going to push past them all the way to Cucumbona and continue the attack. So the morning, um, it went quite well for the battalions of the 5th Marines, except for the 1st Battalion of the 5th. They hit a, a, a Japanese strong point at the base of Point Cruz, and they pulled the rest of the 5th Marine battalions in. They trapped those Japanese, and they ended up um, eliminating the Japanese pocket. But in the meantime, when they're eliminating this Japanese pocket, the 2nd Marines Regiment, so the two battalions of 2nd Marines and the 1st Battalion and 164th, pushed forward and pushed all the way to um, – what is now known as Rove Creek. So if you go to Guadalcanal now, you'll go to a place called Rove, which is the police headquarters. So that's where they push, push to, or, and, and also has the, the na national prison there. I forgot what the exact name of it. That's the, where the prison and, and the police headquarters is. So that's Rove Creek. So they pushed to there. And, um, and then they were making good progress. So at the same time, when all this was happening, the Japanese, um, there was reports that the Japanese were at Coley Point. Now, if you go on one of my videos called uh, Bala Coley Point, where Chester Puller was wounded, yeah, I'm, once again, I go into great detail about that. But what basically was happening was one of the whole, re the 230th Japanese regiment, this is the regiment that was, was not engaged in the Battle of Henderson Field. In fact, if you remember, this is the regiment that instead of attacking north and south, they got lost in, in, in the jungle and went east and went from uh, west to east and just missed the whole battle. Anyway, this regiment found himself at Coley Point, which is a, a number of miles from Henderson Field to the east. So the, uh, there was about 300 Japanese that landed there. But the Marine intelligence was saying, look, the Japanese were landing a division there. And then once again, the, the perimeter of Lunga was compromised. So, you know, poor Vandergriff, every time he had a good offensive going toward the Matanikau, he would always getting pulled back, you know, once again the, to protect the, the main – um objective and that's henderson field which is probably arguably the probably the, the most important real estate for six months in the whole pacific theater there for a while that henderson field that unsinkable aircraft carrier. so anyway he he stalled the attack he didn't he didn't stop it entirely he just said look you need to stall hold in place so the second marines uh, held in place with the 164th and the fifth marines were pulled back to the perimeter and um Around this time, the 3rd, 3rd of November, the 8th Marine Regiment had been relieved from the garrison duties at Samoa, and they'd landed on Guadalcanal on 3 November. So they brought the 8th Marines up. So the 8th Marines and the 2nd Marines holding this line. You'll see that line there, well, underscored in, in yellow where the 2nd Marines were. And the 164th had moved back. So the 2nd Marines and the 8th Marines, you know, had two regiments, 2nd Marine Division together. So they were holding that line. And once the, the Coley Point battle, the Japanese were defeated at Coley Point, once again, the uh, Vandergriff decided to renew the attack with the 8th Marines in the 2nd, with the 8th pushing um, the attack forward. So here's a contemporary photo, and I like this one because one of my friends, um, 
Peter Flavin from Guadalcanal then and now. He has to colorize this one. So I like the colorization when it's done well because it brings out a lot of details. So you'll see the Japanese line on 1 November, the U.S. line there in 1 November, uh, red and blue lines. And then you'll see the line reached by the 2nd Marines and the 164th on the 4th of November. And you'll see the, the hills there marked 83, 84, 82. This is a good depiction of how the, the ridges on Guadalcanal, and to this day, this is the same way. Um, it depicts it depicts how these, these ridges are. Um, barren, or barren ridges, coral, not too much growth on it, especially heavy vegetation like trees, but then you'll see the, um, the thick jungle, especially the ravines. If you see that little ravine between the red and blue lines, that was the ravine where Puller battalion on the um, 9th of, of October wiped out a whole Japanese battalion. And also this is the same area that on 27th of November that he, the Puller battalion was almost wiped out in, in the little Dunkirk. You can see them all on my videos. So this area is a um, very well fought over um, place on Guadalcanal. It's unfortunate that, you know, that people who do the week long tours or even visit Guadalcanal, um, they stay in the uh, the nice hotels normally, and all the nice hotels are located in this area. Um, that's Point Cruz, where the docks are now, and that's downtown Honiara, which is the capital city. Um, and you'll notice when you guys that stay in these hotels, you know they they get on the trips, they go to the places where you, you think you'd want to go. And, and most popular would be in Bloody Ridge, um, Alligator Creek, Mount Austin, but they don't even realize that they're living and sleeping and eating on the most heavily fought over contested parts of the whole Guadalcanal campaign. You know, I've told a number when I did a number of tours there, you know, I mentioned that to people and people who've been to Guadalcanal a number of times, I'd never realized that. I go, yeah, it's a lot of stuff happened in this area where your hotel is right now. Um, so if you ever go to Guadalcanal, um, think about that. But this good good photo here, they advanced there, and you can see how the ravines are. The Japanese used to go up in those ravines and put the machine guns facing back down to the coastal track, and that's a good depiction of the coastal trail uh, that the Marines had, or the referred to um, government track, coastal track. It went straight down, and that was fairly thick jungle in there, and there's a bit of an open area. So I'll go back to there. So... The 8th Marines and the 2nd Marines are given on the 22nd of, of November the push to the Poha. Sorry. I'll take that back. From the Sorry, the 10th. 10th to the 12th, they were given the, um, the orders to continue the assault. So they continued their assault. And I'll go back to this one. And they pushed a bit further than the line reached on the 4th of November. Um, and they ended up on the 12th of November. Now, they were bypassing um, Japanese dug into the coral ridges. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a good photo of one of the um, Japanese dugouts that was actually in the, the coral ridges at Point Cruz. And you can see how they, they dug in there. And then this has been blasted out. And there's obviously no Japanese in there. But they were very well camouflaged. So the, the veterans at the time of the battle mentioned how well camouflaged they were. You know, the Japanese didn't open up until they were, you know, meters and, and sometimes feet from it. They didn't even see the, the, um, the bunkers. So here's another bunker. It's destroyed Japanese bunker, but once again, it's in the, um, in the coral ridge there. And the Japanese would face these um, toward the coastal track, and a lot of them were in defilade, so the Marines couldn't engage them up front, so they had to actually pass them, <clears throat> or they'd actually look up these ravines, and Japanese could fire, inflate fire straight down the ravines. And they had the borders on the reverse slopes too. So it was hard, hard um, fighting for the Marines to try to clear these uh, Japanese out. All right, so this is a push to the Poha from the 18th to the 20th of November. So I'll go back to this and let you have a good look at this um, Japanese bunker while I'm talking about what happened between the 12th and the 18th. So the Marines were going quite well. The 8th Marines and the 2nd Marines were attacking quite well. And once again, um, Van der Griffin received information that the large Japanese convoy uh, with troops were coming down. And, um, and it's very correct, too, because what the Japanese wanted to do, they wanted to uh, replicate their October offensive 
where they brought battleships in, they blasted Henderson Field, and they destroyed the Air Force enough so they can unload another large contingent, this being from the 38th Division, um, of artillery, infantry, and, and um, tanks. And they were just going to do another ma major assault, just like they did in October. You know, there's no stopping the Japanese at this stage. They kept on the offensive. I mean, these guys are with full speed. But the, the Americans had, uh, had the information they were coming, so that's when you come into the great naval battle, especially in that mid-November um, of Guadalcanal. The battles, naval battle of Guadalcanal fought over a, a, roughly a week. And that's when you had the the, um, the Japanese battleships sinking, and you had the Japanese battleships against American battleships, and it's some intensive naval uh, warfare and, and battles there. And uh, the, the Japanese um, transports sinking, and they ground like four Japanese transports on the beach. And those famous photos, you'll see some of the Japanese transports in there to this day. You know, they unloaded um, a lot of their troops, but most of their equipment was lost at sea or turned back. So during this time, on the 12th of November, they, the 8th Marines and the 2nd and, and the rest of the Marines pulled completely uh, back away from Point Cruz and uh, back across the Matanacal and held the Matanacal line. So once that great naval battle um, was won by the, the Allies, then the um, Vandergriff wanted to do one final push um, toward the Cucumbona uh, once again. So at this stage, the 1st Marine Division was, was pretty well spent. I mean, their offensive capability was, was almost nil, I mean, due to disease and, um, and dysentery and, and casualties. You know, they didn't have much fight still left in them. So luckily, the U.S. Army had started landing more troops in, in the, the form of the Marikow Division. So they'd landed uh, the 182nd Regiment, and they had the 164th Regiment, and you, and you had the two um, regiments of the, the 1st Marine Division there. So they're going to renew the attack, Vandergriff said, on the 18th of November. So what they did was the Army started out with 182nd and 164th. They pushed across. Uh, the Matanical, and here's a good photo from that. This is the 23rd aerial, aerial photo that the U.S. Army had actually um, <clears throat> depicted some of the units there. So my yellow line up to the top right, you won't be able to see it, but believe me, just trust me on this one. That shows the 8th Marine Regiment. So they're in reserve during the initial stage of this assault. <clears throat> second Marines are back at the, um, second Marine Regiment is back at the Malunga Perimeter. So the 182nd and 164th was pushing off, and they pushed across the Matanikau, no problem. Then they hit that line there. It says heavily fortified. So what the Japanese did when the Marines pulled out on the 12th, they moved in there with some fresh troops, and they dug in hard, a lot harder than it, I mean, more intense than they did before. And um, that's actually quite quite a good area to dig in. I mean, my, my office when I worked on Guadalcanal is right basically where that H is on heavy, and then that was where my office was. And that's a good choke point, too. It's a good place. I used to look at it all the time and say, well, you know, I can understand why they defended this spot. It's a good good area to defend. So the Japanese defended the area. So the 164th and 182nd had moved up, and then they started getting run into that Japanese line. Well, the 182nd, well, they'd only been there a week, and the fresh troops never been seen in combat before. So that, that top unit there, and I'll go back to this slide here, Towards Point Cruz, they got hit by a Japanese counterattack by some fresh Japanese troops. And that depicts the red arrows there. And they pushed this uh, battalion of the 182nd back. And this is the only time in the whole campaign, and it's not um, written that, that much. You won't find it too many accounts other than, you know, um, some of the accounts said oh, the 182nd uh, pulled back hastily. But you read some of the memoirs from the Army and the Marines, who was actually on the ground, and they said the 182nd, um, that battalion, uh, two companies basically turned and ran. Um, you know, that you can't really fault them. And they're very green troops. And, you know, they've only been in Guadalcanal a week. But they got pushed back. <clears throat> and their but Brigadier General Seabury, which was their commanding general at the time, he was on the scene. Him, officers, him, some other officers, and some <clears throat> some of the other units managed to rally these guys in, in, um, in conjunction with one of the 164th, who were a fairly veteran unit at the time, good unit of the North Dakota National Guard. 
they end up pushing the Japanese back, reestablishing that line. And that's when you see that the last blue line. So that line was reestablished. And the 8th Marines started moving up then at this, at this stage to assist. So the 164th pushed, and they tried to attack in these ravines, and they got pushed back. So on the uh, 22nd of November, they brought the 8th Marines up, and the 8th Marines, you know, fairly cocky as Marines generally are, and said, oh, look, you know, Army guys, stand aside. The Marines will show how this is done. So the Marines started off, and they attacked um, on the 22nd against Hill 83. Let me see if I can get a good photo. Okay, there's a kind of side shot there, excuse me, <coughs> of the of the um the battlefield. Tab Hill 80 there. That's where the Marines kicked off from against Hill 83. And they ran in some strong Japanese defenses. And after a number of assaults, they were stopped in their tracks. So they didn't get any further than the US Army guys did. So these uh the Marines were were stopped cold on the 22nd of november so they they stopped all their attacks by the 23rd and then it goes back to this slide here dispositions at a zero i think this is 0630 on november the 23rd 1942. so the marines eighth marines after they they uh failed in their assaults they pulled them back against mechanic uh, across mechanic out of the reserve so you had the 182nd and 164th man in that line all right now this line became known as the Point Cruise Line. So Van der Griff said, I'm not going to commit any more forces there. They're very strong. So it's not really worth it at this stage to get from fresher troops in and do a, a you know a more coordinated attack because it would just lose too many, too many men there. So here's a it's not a Google shot. This was I think well 19, 1980s or 1990s. So I, I was going to use this, but I don't want to use the Google one too much because it's a lot more cluttered now, but this gives a better depiction. And then they're posed on a quite modern thing. So where it says 78, that's Hill 78. That little round building to the right is actually the Parliament House of the Solomon Island. So if you go there, you get your bearings, and that's where you are. So the, the Americans are on Hill 78, Hill 80, 81. It says Ravine to the left, and that red line is obviously a front line. So it wasn't that far apart from each other. Hill 84 there, the Japanese were dug in. The Japanese generally wasn't on the front slope. Now, if you go into the ravine, the Japanese had um, bunkers, right, at ground level. And they were they were sighted, not facing back toward Hill 80. They were facing down the ravine. So any uh, American attack would go down into the ravine, and they couldn't see these Japanese pillboxes. The Japanese uh, bunkers would take them out of enfilade fire. And Japanese were on the verse slopes. As soon as the uh, U.S. hit the top of the hill, say, for example, on 84, 83, <clears throat> they would get hit by the Japanese. So good uh, rear slope defense. So you couldn't engage them directly by fire. And uh, the U.S. Army and the Marines dug in on this line. And just like I wrote there or typed in there from November to January, this became the front line. And... Excuse me. <clears throat> so this is the front line. And there's a lot of patrols and sniping and mortar fire went on throughout this time, but generally it was, you know, come no man's land in this area. <coughs> All right. So now we get up to January 42. The first Marine Division had left in the, by the end of December. And the U.S. Army had taken over under Alexander Patch. He became the overall commander of all the other forces there. So no 1st Marine Division there. It was 2nd Marine Division. So the 2nd Marine Division uh, arrived as a whole on the 13th of January. And here you'll see that was the patch with the Indian head. That was what the 2nd um, Infantry Division uh, wore in World War I. And the Marines were part of that. So sometimes the 2nd, uh, the 6th Marines, uh, adopt that you see them see them war I mean, they don't wear them today but sometimes it depicts the the marines the sixth marine regiment then in the middle there you have the eighth marine regiment in the top right you have the second marine regiment and then you had the cannon cockers as they call them or the artillery regiment of the the 10th marines and then you have the 18th marine regiment which was the engineer regiment 
later became the second engineer uh, regiment. So they're the, the main components of the division. They landed as a whole on the 13th of January. And on the 13th of January, this is the first time the division fought uh, together in World War II. Um, the U.S. Army uh, patch had a U.S. Army offensive. Let me see if I got it. I think the next slide. So I'll go back to this slide. So the U.S. Army decided to do a major offensive on the 10th of January. So that's when uh, Mount Austin, the attacks on Mount Austin, um, you'll see some of my videos of the, the, the Mount Austin, the Gifu, the Galloping Horse, the Seahorse. You know, the 25th Infantry Division had landed by this time, and they were given a test um, in 10th of January of taking out the Galloping Horse, which is some ridges to the uh, west of Matanikau, to isolate the Gifu, which is that um, large Japanese stronghold on top of Mount Austin. And then once they isolated, they would take it out with the, the assault. And once they did that, um, the 2nd Marine Division was covering the coast. Then they would start their assault uh, down the coast against these Japanese um, heavy positions that they had encountered in um, November. So here's a, a slide depicting it. 2nd Marine Division advanced the 13th to the 18th of January. So you had the 8th Marines Regiment on the right and the 2nd Marine Regiment on the left. So on the, the morning of the 13th, they've kicked off with their assault. The second Marines did quite well. Um, you'll see that little um, the advance they made. They made a cross hill from 66, they advanced cross hill 78 and 81. Um, they encountered uh, uh, some Japanese resistance, but they managed to overcome it. The 8th Marines, once they, uh, they moved out too, but they hit that solid line, the same line they encountered in November, and they were pinned down. They couldn't make any advance. So... Uh, on the evening of the 13th, the 2nd Marine Regiment pulled out, and the 6th Marines, the first time the, in the combat, uh, went in and took over the 2nd Marines' um, position. So once again, this is the first time the 2nd Marine Division are fighting as an entire division. So um, on the 14th, yeah, so on the 14th to 15th, the Marines, 8th Marines pushed. Um, um, in conjunction with the 6th Marines covering their flank, and they man managed to overcome those Japanese bunkers, and they pushed all the way to that last blue line you see um, on the 18th. A few notes in this, a few um, points to point out. The 15th um, of November was the first time the U.S. Marines ever used flamethrowers in action. You know, they had this new thing called a flamethrower. They, um, <clears throat> they didn't have a chance to use it, and they said, well, let's, let's use it. Well, the engineers brought these flamethrowers and they um, put them to use with the demolition and flamethrowers. So this, they started to do the um, court screw and blow, uh, blow torch techniques. They um, perfected, especially in 44 and 45. And they started using these to great effect against these Japanese coconut log bunkers, especially the, um, the flamethrower. They worked very well. So they managed to um, overcome these Japanese bunkers and they ended up on the 18th of January forming that line. Well, the army had taken out the uh, reduced the Gifu and defeated the Japanese up in the Mount Austin area. So, um, a point here to I'll bring up this is a very interesting point. <clears throat> it shows how the different services thought at the time. So, the, the second Marine Division commander at the time was Major General Marston. So, Marston, uh, instead of being landed on Guadalcanal to take control of the second Marine division he outranked the head the the top uh, u.s army general which is alexander patch on guadalcanal so they couldn't have him landing because he would outrank it outrank him and be overall commander and marston even said look you know i'll just waiver that and you know patch can remain uh, overall commander but the powers to be said no 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 we we, we don't want any conf conflict there we want Patch to be the overall commander. We don't want a Marine being overall commander. I think that's what it went down to in inter-service robberies, but who, who knows? <clears throat> but needless to say, Marston did not land on Guadalcanal, so he didn't command his division, which is probably a, a major, major disappointment for him. So the uh, assistant division commander, um, uh, Dicare, Brigadier General Dicare, was the um, division commander of the 2nd Marine Division. So that's a little side note. So anyway, on the 18th of... Uh, January, the 2nd Marine Division um, had accomplished their objectives, and they were basically around the uh, the Rove um, Creek area. 
against the Japanese, waiting for the the U.S. Army then to renew their assault. Um, with Patch pushing the um, the assault and to eliminate the Japanese <clears throat> on the island. <clears throat> so this is just shows a photo of the um, the six Marines relieving the second Marines um, from the Matanical line. <clears throat> you won't be able to see it here, but there's a good photo and it shows the six Marine guys. Some of them are still wearing the Kelly helmets, the old War one, War one style helmets. And you see some of them standing there and, and then the second Marines are marching down um, from these, these ridges. And you'll see the up on the left there, there's a tent and that's what the Marines used to do. They'd, they'd have their admin quarters. You've seen some of the videos, especially around the bloody Ridge area that their admin and their sleeping quarters and supply and first aid, they'd be on the reverse slope and they'd dig in the reverse slope. And then on the other side, on the military crest, was where they'd be digging their fighting bunkers and fighting holes. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> that takes us to the renewal of the assault. Um, so after the 18th, the 8th Marines had pulled back, and the 2nd Marines had pulled back, leaving only, and the rest of the division pulled back to the, uh, the perimeter, leaving only the 6th Marines there. So the U.S. Army <clears throat> under Patch when it commits, uh, recommits the offensive, continue on. So you'll notice here, I blew this up. You have the six Marines and the 182nd and the 147th. A very unique time in <clears throat> Guadalcanal history or U.S. history, Armed Forces history. The only time I know, well, they formed a composite division. They call it the CAM Division, uh, Combined Army Marine Division. So the a temporary division set up by the um, patch and it formed the six Marine regiment, the 182nd um, army regiment and 147th army regiment. <clears throat> Another side note, the 147th army regiment was an independent regiment. And um, after you uh, see this video, have a look and look up the 147th regiment, look at their record. Um, they fall all over the Pacific. They were at Iwo Jima. Okinawa, you know, they were in Saipan. And you, most people probably never heard of the 147th. But yeah, look them up. They're a very interesting um, unit. Anyway, they were, the, <clears throat> they were a very fresh unit. Their last regiment to land, the U.S. regiment to land on Guadalcanal in, to participate in the campaign. So um, <clears throat> they commenced the, uh, the assault in the end of January with the six Marines there on the coast. And they started the assault and they started pushing it at the same time the U.S. Army 25th was on their flank. I don't have that one, but they're, they're on the left flank pushing to envelop the Japanese. So the Japanese this stage had basically um, was spent. You know, their offensive capability was gone. Um, they were losing, you know, 30 to 40 guys a day, apparently, from just starvation alone. <clears throat> no fresh troops. You know, their, their back was broken, so to speak, and they were just hanging on. You know, but this time the Japanese high command on the 31st of, of December decided that Japanese or the Guadalcanal was going to be evacuated by the Japanese. So these guys are just waiting to be, they didn't know they're going to be evacuated. They were just waiting for additional reinforcements to continue the assault. But I think they were just leaving hour by hour, these, these fellows. And they were literally starving. Because if you remember, I think one of, one of my episodes, I talked about there's roughly, you know, 20,000 Japanese it, it died on land on Guadalcanal. Um, about 9,500 died from combat, the rest from disease and starvation. So the Japanese were actually starving to death there. So here's some now photos of that area where <clears throat> I've been depicting in some of these slides. So that's the ravine, the one on the left. Um, that's, that's Hill 80, one. On the right-hand side, and I'm taking the, the photo from Hill 83 from the Japanese perspective. <clears throat> so you can see, sorry, excuse me, a lot of talking makes my mouth dry. I really have to apologize for doing that, guys. Anyway, <clears throat> you'll see the um, the terrain, how, how um, steep and thick it is. So the Japanese, I mean, the Marines would have to attack, and the Army would have to attack down that slope to the furthest slope, straight down and straight back up. The Japanese positions was on the reverse slope, and in the in the bottom in the in the the, um, the bottom bit there. And on the right hand side, this is taken from 
some of the hills uh, past uh, Point Cruz, looking back um, toward that area. So that peninsula in the far, the first peninsula you see is the Lunga perimeter or Lunga Point. And airfield is just to the right of that. Then in the far distance, you'll see the Florida Islands. And that's where Tulagi is. And then that far right peninsula is Coley Point. And uh, Point Cruz is roughly to the right into the forefront there. <clears throat> I love this photo. This is the Point Cruz line. So this is a, uh, I'd say, probably taken in November, December, 42. I don't know if you're able to see it. I've, I've put a highlight in the yellow line there. That's a series of uh, bunker positions. So that's the front line. So these guys here are on Hill 78 in OP position. So if you, I don't know if you get very um, detailed in looking at that photo, but there's some good, good um, bits of good gear these um, Marines have in this photo. It's an observation post. And that's Point Cruz. There on the top there, I've labeled it. You gives you a good indication how the terrain was. It's fairly open in that area then. And um, they used to call this Hell's Half Acre. Um, a lot of fighting was, was in this area. So if you go to Guadalcanal to today, um, <clears throat> the King Soul Hotel is right there. The Heritage Lodge um, Hotel is to the left. Point Cruz is there. It's it's right in the middle of um of the um, main capital now. Once again, that's a another depiction of the previous slide I showed you. Another um <clears throat> good photo. And this is taken from with the 25th Infantry Division where they did their flank attack, and the, the 6th Marine Division, the Cam Division, it would be to the left in this photo attacking down the um, the coast. That hill in the far distance is Mount Austin. That was where the, the Gifu was. So this is how it looked during the time of the battle. Now, where I'm standing now is at the opening um, to the White River or Kukumbona. That was where the 17th Japanese um, Army had their headquarters. So this is uh, just another depiction of an arrow shot during the time of the battle. And this shows some of the ridges. Are pushing toward the Cucumbona where the Cam Division and the 25th Division was was attacking. So in the bottom, getting Hill 96, 95, and Hill 91. So the the um, 25th Division, the 27th Regiment, I think, was was flanking those, and the six um, Marines and the rest of the Cam Division was pushing down the coast at the same time, and they were just overcoming the Japanese resistance. This is a Japanese map. Um, I'll get my face off here so you can see more of it. This is a Japanese map uh, depicting that same area. <clears throat> and um, basically has the Japanese units there, has Japanese um, artillery and um, some of the other positions that, that actually dug in. And this is from the Japanese 2nd Division. And that you see Point Cruise to the right, and you'll see that main Japanese line. Um, that second creek to the left, that's the Rove Creek. A rove, as they call it nowadays. Here's some of the area I'm talking about um, <clears throat> where the six Marines attacked down with the Cam Division toward Kukumbana. So Kukumbana was the main objective for the most of the Marines' campaign. That's where they wanted to push the Japanese back, but they never. The first Marine Division never did. It was only to the the very end of the campaign where Kukumbana was taken. And you'll see Kukumbana there. So this area I have circled. I'll go back to. So that's that's looking down into the area where I had circled. So the area to the left and the flat is the area area where the red circle is. There. I'm standing on one of these hills, one of these hills, ninety five or ninety six, looking down. This is the government track. This is some of the second Marine, um, or sorry, six Marine regiment on the push to Cucumbona. And you'll see it said 143. So that was the day it was taken. So you can see how the area looked. And we say coastal track or government track. That's the only road they had on Guadalcanal pre-war, and that's it. You know, it's just a trail. You know, <clears throat> not much of a of a road, so to speak. But that's all they had, the best they had. And 
Um, then you'll see how the, the campaign ended, the final phase from 26th of January to 9th of February. You'll notice the 6th Marine Division on the 26th. That was their last really fight um, at Poha um, River um, past Kukumbana. And there was a good little fight at the Poha River. You know, the Japanese, what they would do, they would leave their rear guard guys in in the rear um, uh, rear slope positions. Once the Marines and the Army passed them, then they would shoot back at them, then, you know, obviously fight to the death. And what the Japanese had done in Operation K, uh, KE, what the Japanese had actually done, that was their evacuation. Um, and they'd brought in a fresh battalion of Japanese um, to serve as rear guard to protect the rest of them while they did the evacuation there at Cape Esperance there with a the red arrow. <clears throat> but the Marines, or sorry, the U.S. military thought the Japanese were, were planning for another offensive. The Japanese did a good deception campaign um, to say that, to make it look like they're um, pre preparing for another offensive toward um, Guadalcanal to mask their um, withdrawal. It went to the final days that the, the U.S. Army and the Marines started working out there. The Japanese were evacuating. So that's why you'll see on the left-hand side, the 2 the 6th of February, they landed a, a battalion of the 132nd there um, <clears throat> to try to cut them off at um, Verahu. They landed there in the Lieutenant George. Um, and, and they moved, or sorry, or Colonel George, and they moved up through there. Um, but the Japanese were able to evacuate um, on the, the nights of the 1st and 2nd day, the 4th and the 5th, and the 7th, 8th of February, to evacuate almost 11,000 Japanese. Um, almost like the Gallipoli campaign, you know, fought in the, in the First World War by the, the British and the Australians and the French. You know, the most successful part of the, their campaign was evacuation. So you could say the same here for the Japanese. I think it was only the, probably the only island they were able to evacuate this many troops throughout the Pacific. Because after that, you know, the, the Allies ruled the sea and they weren't able to do that. But this stage, the, the forces are still on par and the Japanese were able to do the, the night evacuation. So basically... That ends the, the 2nd Marines uh, Division's participation on Guadalcanal. This patch here is the, the original 2nd Marine Division patch. And it was patterned um, after the 1st Marine Division um, patch in December, or I think in January 43 when they went to Gu uh, um, Australia. You know, it has the Southern Cross there, you know, with the, the word Guadalcanal and a snake looks like the number two so that was their the patch so i don't know the really history behind why they didn't adopt this maybe because it looked very similar to the first marines and they wanted to have their own separate identity and they adopted the other patch i had at the very first of my episode so <clears throat> i hope you enjoyed um, this episode in the second marine um, division on guadalcanal i plan to do further ones but i hope to get to guadalcanal hopefully at the end of this year and do some on the ground filming so if you got any questions or comments, you know, put them in the comment section or, or just send me a, on my Facebook page, send me a PM. I'm happy to help if you've got any questions or if you have any vets um, uh, that you know of or, you know, knew of or, or family members, you want more information about maybe it served on Guadalcanal, what they did, just let me know. And hopefully I can provide you with the, the records as much as I can uh, where they served and, and probably give you some now photos. Love it. So um, hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time. Thank you.